more than 37% of us are eating fast food every day. 80% of Americans have less than three servings of vegetables and fruit per day. A terrible diet makes you more likely to be missing the key building blocks that you need. So what should we be eating? What should the diet pattern look like? Diet pattern look like? Diet is so important. You cannot exercise or meditate your way out of a terrible diet. You see, our cells, our tissues, our organs, the body we have tomorrow is from the food we eat today. And we have radically changed what we eat in the last hundred years. Now, more than 37% of us are eating fast food every day. And the younger you are, the more fast food you're eating. Some people are eating fast food for all of their meals. People have forgotten how to meal plan, how to shop, how to cook using recipes, using ingredients. 80% of Americans have less than three servings of vegetables and fruit per day. Americans are eating 150 pounds of white flour, 200 pounds of added sugars every year. All of that sugar and processed food is feeding the sugar-loving yeast and bacteria and starving the health-promoting bacteria. And remember, the food you eat shapes your microbiome which will shape your immune system. And a poor diet, a terrible diet, makes you more likely to be missing the key building blocks that you need to make your cells, your tissues, your organs, your body. You'll be missing the key vitamins, minerals, essential fats, and proteins. We can't do the biochemistry of life properly. We can't build the protein structures. We can't repair the damage. We can't fight off the threats the key nutrients for all of our cells. I'll start with the cell membranes. The cell membranes are the fat wrappers around our cells. They are the fat wrappers around our mitochondria and the other organelles within our cells. You need cholesterol, essential fats, which means you cannot make them. And those two fats are the omega-3 fats and the omega-6 fats. You also need phospholipids like phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylethanolamine, Phosphatil serine to make healthy cell membranes. And myelin, that is the fatty insulation around the wiring between all of your brain cells. Myelin is made of cell membranes. It needs all of those fats and those phospholipids. Mitochondria, that's the powerhouse for our cells. They're really ancient bacteria that evolved billions of years ago and could take advantage of oxygen to make ATP, adenosine triphosphate, the currency of life, because our cells use ATP to drive all of the biochemical processes in our cells. If we don't have enough ATP, our cells cannot do the work to which they are assigned, and the cell will slowly falter and die. And a faltering ATP production will accelerate autoimmunity. Mitochondria need B vitamins, they need minerals, especially zinc and magnesium, Essential fats, that's that the omega-3 fat, the omega-6 fat, carnitine, creatine, coenzyme Q. Which is one of the reasons I encourage organ meats like oysters, mussels, clams, heart, and liver. If you're vegetarian or vegan, then it may be appropriate and important to have some testing and take some targeted supplements to be sure that you have those key mitochondrial nutrients. So what should we be eating? What should the diet pattern look like? First, I want to tell you that, in part thanks to the research that I do, there are more researchers investigating diet in the setting of multiple sclerosis. Now, the diets with the most favorable research data for reducing fatigue are the Walls diet, the Mediterranean diet, and the Swank diet. For improving quality of life, it's the Mediterranean diet and the Walls diet. And interestingly enough, uh, when we looked at the effect size, uh, it, the diet with the largest effect size, that is the greatest improvement in quality of life, greatest reduction in fatigue severity, was the Walls diet. I should also mention, what is the common denominator for all of these diet patterns? And that includes the keto diet as well. It's more non-starchy vegetables, less added sugar, less processed food, fewer carbs than the standard American diet. So that's a great first step, adding more vegetables and cutting or reducing the added sugar and processed foods. The Walls diet is a modified Paleolithic diet. 
Now keep in mind, I had followed the Paleolithic diet for five years and continued to decline. It wasn't until I restructured that paleo diet to focus on the key nutrients that were critical to my cell membranes and my mitochondria that I had that transformation. So the Walls diet starts with nine cups measured raw of leafy vegetables, sulfur rich vegetables, and deeply colored vegetables. It's three cups of green leafy vegetables, things like kale, uh, spinach, uh, Swiss chard, romaine lettuce, three cups of sulfur rich, things like cabbage family, onion family, mushroom family vegetables, and three cups of deeply pigmented beets, carrots, berries. Sufficient protein. If you're a meat eater, it's two palm-sized servings of meat. If you're a vegetarian or a vegan, it's gluten-free grains and legumes. And liver, heart, oysters, mussels are encouraged. Fermented foods like sauerkraut and kimchi are encouraged. Nutritional yeast uh, is encouraged in seaweed a couple times a month. I ask people to remove gluten, which is the protein in wheat, rye, barley, many ancient grains, and casein, the protein in dairy, because the amino acid sequence in gluten and casein are very, very similar. If you react to gluten, you will probably react to casein. And unrecognized gluten sensitivity can be a big driver for creating the autoimmune processes, the autoantibodies, and the autoimmune diagnosis. If you've been eating these foods all of the time, you have no idea if removing gluten and casein may reduce your symptoms, improve your quality of life. I also remove eggs. Eggs are really great superfood, particularly the yolks, but they are the third most common unrecognized food sensitivity. So I ask people to remove gluten, casein, and eggs. After three months, you can try reintroducing the eggs and see if you tolerate them. I also recommend that you reduce or eliminate added sugars, processed foods, and fast foods. I'm not a fan of gluten-free products. Most of them are highly processed, ultra-processed. I'd much rather you eat foods that are naturally gluten-free, vegetables, berries, uh, and your source of proteins. Again, I tell my autoimmune patients, even though they perceive they have no reaction to eating gluten or casein, I ask them to remove gluten because they may have unrecognized gluten sensitivity and remove dairy because the protein in dairy, which is casein, has a similar amino acid sequence to the sequence uh, in gluten. Also, gluten and dairy proteins stimulate the opioid receptors. Stopping gluten, stopping dairy, stopping sugar and processed foods may lead to some withdrawal symptoms with headaches, irritability, and an intense craving. That is really quite noticeable the first week, less so the second week, and for the vast majority resolved by the third week. This is a family intervention. Diet changes are much more successful when they are done as a family. Doing so improves the health of everyone, including the children. I talk to my patients, I encourage them to pick a dietary pattern that speaks to them and that they can do as a family. First decide what you're going to add or increase, and then discuss what you're going to reduce and what you're going to eliminate. It's usually much easier to do the food additions first before you begin taking things away. The foods that you've eliminated, get them out of the line of sight. When you, again, when you stop sugar, stop processed foods, stop gluten and casein, you may experience craving, headaches, and some irritability, and withdrawal symptoms. Worse the first week, less the second week, and nearly always resolved by the third week. Physical activity, exercise, and movement. These are so critical. Your body prioritizes what you are using. If you are not using some part of your body, your body, your immune cells, will take resources from that parts of your body and delegate it to other parts of your body. If you're not moving your muscles, your bones, you will lose bone mineral density, you will lose muscle mass. It's important to work on your strength, your balance, your coordination, your fine motor skills, and your endurance. I talk to my patients about their lifestyle. 
What are they doing with walking, shopping, laundry, going up and down stairs? This counts as movement. I ask if they're doing dancing, yoga, tai chi, Pilates. Would they be open to adding music? Would they be interested in adding family and friends? Can they take classes? You can also get additional devices to help you. Things like free weights, exercise bands, a vibration plate. A vibration plate is an exercise most that you can do while standing on a plate that will probably be an oscillator where it goes up and down ever so slightly. It gives you a little more gravitational force. It lets you get a little more intensity to your exercise in a shorter period of time. It is a very gentle way to improve bone density and muscle mass. And for many with a systemic autoimmune disease, because we have taken so many rounds of steroids, our bone mineral density has been slowly declining. We are told that we have osteopenia or we may have osteoporosis. Using a vibration plate is a complementary alternative medicine approach towards improving your bone density and your muscle mass. Doing physical activity is so important to maintain your strength, your balance, and your vitality. Remember, use it or lose it. Stress reducing practices are really helpful at lowering your cortisol and improving your cortisol response. Now we do need stress to grow stronger bones, stronger muscles, and we need the stress of learning and adapting to our environment to maintain our brain volume and maintain our cognition. But we also need rest and relaxation too. How are you reducing your stress? There are many options. We have meditation that is focused on mantras, such as a single word or phrase, a guided meditation, mindfulness focused on a sensation such as chewing or breathing, a prayer, moderate exercise. You can do Epsom salt soaks, Dead Sea soaks. You could have a biofeedback with a sensor that gives you feedback on your alpha waves in your brain or feedback on your pulse. You could have binaural beats where you have earphones, one in each ear, that st stimulate a frequency that's slightly different in your right ear and your left ear that will induce alpha waves and a deep relaxation. Stress is vital to our health, but we must have periods of rest and relaxation. How are you doing that for yourself? How's your vagal tone? Our nervous system has a sympathetic branch and a parasympathetic branch. When we are facing a threat, the sympathetic system activates. We have a fight or flee response. Sometimes it's a freeze response. And all of our cellular resources are redirected to make us ready to flee or fight our opponent. If we have the parasympathetic uh, response, when we are safe, our cellular resources can be directed to make hormones, to detox and repair tissues. So I talk to my patients about how important it is to stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. And I do that by working on our vagal tone exercises. We can hum, we can sing, we can do diaphragmatic breathing. We can also gargle. I'll give you a quick example. Gargling. Every day when you brush your teeth, a great way to stimulate your vagal tone. The goal is to get good sleep. No, really, the goal is to get great sleep. I want you to shoot for seven to nine hours. Start with getting morning daylight sun exposure. Go outside, look at the clouds, look at the sky around the sun, but not directly at the sun. That daylight will help set the circadian rhythm, which will help get your hormones in a healthier balance. And do your exercise in the morning and early afternoon. If you exercise too late in the afternoon, it will cause a cortisol spike, which will make it difficult to fall asleep at night. Sleep in a cool, dark sleeping environment. Have an evening ritual to wind down. Have your artificial light be tuned to the daylight or full spectrum lighting in the morning until noon. In the afternoon, the spectrum can be a bit warmer. And then when the sun goes down, use red light or amber lights in the evening. Avoid blue lights uh, in the evening. Avoid your phone, your computer, 
because those blue lights, those artificial lights, will activate your cortisol and will suppress your melatonin. You can have apps on your phone that will shift the display to the warmer tones as the sun goes down. Alternatively, you can use blue blockers. These are glasses with a yellow tone, orange tone, or a red tone that will block that blue light part of the display that comes out of your smartphone, your computer, or your television. Again, the goal is to get seven to nine hours of great sleep every night. Reduce your toxin exposure and improve your clearance of those toxins. Our water, air, the water we drink, the air we breathe, the food that we consume often have chemicals as part of the water, air, and food. For that reason, I encourage filtering your water. You can use a pitcher or a reverse osmosis water filtration under the sink, or you could use a whole house filter. You could get a air filtration system for your room, your apartment, or on your furnace and air conditioning system. If you smoke, I encourage you to stop smoking. And use organic food in personal care products according to what your budget will afford. The Environmental Working Group also has a guide for personal care product selection as well, because many personal care products also have hormone disrupting chemicals and heavy metals in them. Again, reduce your exposure by filtering your air, your water, and going as organic in your food and your personal care products as your budget will allow. Now, you may know that smoking accelerates your risk for autoimmunity. And you may know that being sedentary is even more potent than smoking. But did you know that being lonely is more potent than either smoking or being sedentary for accelerating your risk of autoimmune disease? Find a way to get connected to friends and family. Think about reconnecting with your religious roots. Join your church, synagogue, temple, mosque. Look for other support peer groups that you can join. It might be yoga, Tai Chi, Pilates, uh, a dancing group. Can you meet in person? Or are there Zoom opportunities? Or can you simply call and write letters to friends and family? Get connected. Remember, loneliness is a huge driver of inflammation. Find a way to be connected with people that matter to you. Improve your self-talk. All of us have a coach on one shoulder and a critic on the other shoulder. The coach is encouraging, telling us that we're doing a good job, encouraging forward progress. And the critic is telling us that we are a failure, that no one believes in us, and that we have a terrible future ahead. Now, when I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, and I finally had to sit down and tell my children, they were still very young. I needed them to not be afraid of the future. And even though I was terrified, I sat down with a lot of confidence, sat tall, put my arms out, and it was very reassuring that yes, I have multiple sclerosis, but it is treatable, that I'm seeing one of the best MS clinics in the country, seeing the very best people taking the newest drugs. And I was very confident that everything was going to be okay because I needed my kids to believe that everything was going to be okay. And the more confidence that I spoke with them, the better I felt. And then I had to get my wheelchair. And then I had to tell my staff at work. I was the chief of mandatory care at the Iowa City VA. I was also the regional network director for the medical and specialty medicine service line. I didn't want to resign either one of those positions. I needed to convey to my staff that everything was going to be fine, that I could still do my job. Now, mind you, in my heart, I was very afraid. But nonetheless, I got my wheelchair, I sat tall, I spoke with confidence, and over and over again, I said, the wheelchair is just a tool, I can still do my job, everything will be fine. I said that again and again and again. And by the end of the week, I was a lot more confident. I did feel much, much calmer. You see, your brain will begin to believe you. Even if you in your heart are uncertain and afraid, if you say over and over again, 
with positive, with confidence, your brain will begin to believe you and you will feel calmer. So I talk to my patients about the power of short positive affirmations. I want you to pick a short declarative sentence that resonates with you, that reflects the actions that you are taking. Sit tall or stand tall, put your arms out, take up space and say things like, I eat for health. I take care of my mitochondria. I love my mitochondria. I love my cells. I love my brain. I am learning. I choose my path. Short declarative sentences said with confidence will help rewire your confidence and rewire your future. Remember, everything is connected to your immune system. Our biochemistry is deeply interconnected. Work at creating a more supportive microenvironment for your cells. Improve your diet, your self-care routine, one habit at a time. Start with small, achievable steps, one at a time. I encourage you to begin with thinking deeply about what is your why. For me, it was my two young children and my spouse. I knew I wanted my children to grow up to be successful adults, and they were going to internalize what they saw me do. When things got tough, did I give up? Or did I keep doing all that I could every day? I knew I wanted them to see me do all that I could every day. I also ask, what is your hero's journey? Every society across the globe, every religion has these great hero stories. Society and the hero are facing a terrible threat and they're losing. The hero separates and goes to work with a wise mentor who teaches them some important and very difficult truth. The hero comes back and joins in the fight with society. Now, if you're in a Eastern culture, the hero might die, but society survives and the hero is venerated. In Western culture, we know that against all odds, somehow the hero and society will survive. But in both Eastern and Western cultures, we know that the fight is incredibly difficult, incredibly hard, and that the chance of failure is very great. I talked about this a lot in our VA clinics. I talk about this with my patients. I explain that for your hero story to be really potent, you need to be facing something that is really, really hard to do, where success is not guaranteed. But if you're willing to do the work, if you're willing to think deeply about what you need to learn, what your society needs to learn, then you will have an incredibly powerful, heroic story that will inspire your family, inspire your friends, and inspire yourself to do the work. Again, we have had millions of people transform their lives using the concepts that I teach in the WALS protocol. We've had thousands of people transform their lives using what you learned in this course. Others need more intensive support and guidance. And we have a variety of programs to help support and guide people in their healing journey. We also have a private practice that focuses on neuroimmune and autoimmune patients. We would love to help support you and your family on your healing journey. Hey, I'm glad you enjoyed this video. We have more on the way, so click the notification bell below and I'll see you in the next one.